gray eyes scan the page. A king is not a conqueror. A king is the symbol of a nation. A king is the representative of his people. Row upon row of words about how a king should be. Yet the eyes in which these words are reflected showed no hint of admiration or discovery. The boy exhales in tedium. These things are already known to him. As a prince, he has been striving to develop all manner of wisdom in order that he might prepare for his future as a king. All these books say the same things. Annoyed, the prince closes the book and makes to return to his quarters. When he reaches the exit, he notices that the guards all seem a bit more on edge than normal. Ah yes, he thinks, the signing ceremony. Today, his father was signing a trade agreement with a neighboring country, supplying them with clockwork soldiers in exchange for large amounts of their natural resources. The neighboring kingdom desired these clockwork soldiers greatly, for they were of small population and thus lacked in troops. But clockwork men who would fight eternally without grumble or pause were a breakthrough solution to this particular problem. And as for the prince's kingdom, they needed natural resources to further their own research and development, much of which was dedicated to these very same clockwork soldiers. His footsteps echo across the marble floor. The castle is large, and it is quite a distance to his chambers. He thinks about the ceremony as he greets another set of guards. Though he is a prince, he has yet to witness such an international affair for himself. It would be good for me to know about such things. Maybe I should take a quick peek and see what it's like. It can only benefit me in the future, after all. Thus, having rationalized it, he decides to walk past the drawing room where the ceremony is being held, on the way back to his chambers. The group from the neighboring country has already arrived, and there is quite a large crowd gathered. There are numerous guards from the prince's kingdom, as well as ones from the opposing side. There are ministers and clerks and advisors and lawyers, and in the center of it all, the two kings. But then, at the edge of the crowd, the prince spies a young girl. She lifts the hem of her white skirt and curtsies at the room seemingly at ease amidst all the murmuring adults. After gazing at her for a bit, realization finally dawns. She's the daughter of the other king, a princess. He recalled what he had just been reading in his book. She is not a king herself, but she seems to understand how a royal family member should act. As he stares, the prince reflects on his own position. Will I ever be that confident? That composed? As if sensing his attention, the princess suddenly turns around. He immediately hides his face behind the book in his hand, but it is a useless gesture. Before he knows it, the princess is approaching him. He tries to pull himself together and fails miserably, but the princess either doesn't notice or doesn't care. Instead, she stands right in front of him and says, You seem pretty weak for a prince. 
What? He responds. The prince immediately rejects his earlier thoughts. She's not acting like royalty at all. She's just rude. Y you're the daughter of the king, he stammers. You should be ashamed to treat a fellow royal in such a way. He thinks his argument came out rather well, all in all, but it is a wasted effort. The princess is wholly uninterested in what he has to say. Right, whatever, listen. Whatever? What do you... The girl suddenly places a finger on his mouth, cutting off his argument. Her lips, which are the color of early spring blossoms, break into a smile as she says, Want to go play? His gray eyes widen in bewilderment. A blazing inferno reflects in a pair of eyes. The girl's empty expression betrays nothing. The sight of flames roaring in the darkness is etched upon her mind. Her heart speaks to her in a dry tone. You will never forget this night. Not for the rest of your life. Mom, come help with this. The girl's bright voice rings through the kitchen. Lined across the table are a colorful array of vegetables in hues of green, yellow, and red, as well as a large piece of meat. Cradling the girl's younger sister, her mother turns to the sound of her older child's pleas. Well, someone's enthusiastic about their cooking. The mother looks on as the girl continues bustling about the kitchen. She is learning to cook from her mother. You need to add a little more seasoning, honey. Here, try it now. The moment the girl brings the food to her mouth, her furrowed brow loosens and a smile breaks out. Oh, yummy. The two chefs look at each other proudly, content in the knowledge the recipe is perfect. The girl sets the steaming dishes down. The mother plops the little sister in her chair as the three of them gather around the table. The wood practically groans under the weight of the food, which is far too much for even three hungry mouths. As the mother starts cutting meat into small pieces for her youngest daughter, she looks at the elder with a wry smile. It's good you got more practice in, but we clearly went overboard on our portion control. Everyone chuckles as they dive into their meal. Dad's coming home soon, right? Asks the girl as she happily bounces up and down in her chair. The letter had arrived a few days ago. It was a notice their father would soon be returning from his military service. The moment the girl read it, she ran into her mother's room and announced her grand plan. I'm going to make dad's favorite dinner when he gets back. She has been awaiting his return for so long.
The last time she saw him was the morning he left for the front. His expression betrayed mixed feelings, and the young girl had no way of knowing what sort of emotions they were. But as he held her tight, he leaned into her ear and whispered, I will come back to you, I promise. That promise was everything to her, and now it is coming true. When she thinks of it, she can hardly contain herself. Feelings she managed to keep suppressed all this time are now bubbling up like water from an overfilled pot. But she manages to hold them back and keep her calm. I'm the older sister now, she thinks. I have to hold it together. Her younger sister was born after her father left, and word of her birth had not been able to reach him on the battlefield. What will Dad think when he sees her? Will he love her like me? Will he love her more than me? The girl shakes her head to clear the ugly thought away. As she rubs her swollen belly, she marvels at how well the cooking lessons have gone. Aside from her ability to judge proper quantities, of course. She leans back in her chair and indulges in a brief flight of fancy. All of her father's favorite foods are lined across the table. As he takes the first bite, a satisfied smile crosses his face. She sits at his side, no longer the young child he once knew, but not yet a woman grown. He'll be amazed to see how much I've changed. It's going to make him so happy. Her reverie is interrupted by the voice of her mother. When you're done wool gathering, you can help clean up. The girl starts, nearly tipping her chair over in the process. You're the older sister now. You can't afford to be lazy. The girl pouts a little at the scolding, but her mother pays this small rebellion no mind. Instead, she entrusts her to take care of the dishes and heads off to attend to her sister. It must be so hard for mom to take care of both of us alone. I need to work as hard as I can to support her. She's always put on a smile for us no matter what. And that's why I've been able to keep going, even when I was sad or lonely. Or depressed. I'm too old to be having jealous fits or slinging snide remarks. So what if she doesn't pay much attention to me anymore? She nods to herself as she reaches this conclusion and proceeds to wash and put away the kitchenware. When night comes, the exhausted girl begins falling asleep the moment her head strikes the pillow. As she drifts off, she feels her mother's hand on her head. Thank you, honey. You are always appreciated. With that, her mother stands and leaves the room. In her dreams, her entire family sits happily around the table. A sudden flash of light streaks out toward the city clock tower. A moment later, a cannonball makes contact with a thundering crash 
and a portion of the tower collapses, raining debris everywhere. Estimating landing points and dispersion range, 5.34 seconds until falling debris impacts ground. At the base of the tower, a man performs rapid calculations, then takes 10 quick paces back. When he stops, the debris strikes the very spot where he had stood just moments before, creating a billowing bloom of dust. But the man pays it no mind. Instead, he focuses on the enemy base that fired the cannon. This battle unfolds in the technologically advanced city of an enemy country. A city where smoke now rises from every corner. The king the man serves has a reputation as a tyrant and has conquered many other nations through force of arms. This war was sparked when he severed diplomatic ties. And like many sparks, it has turned into a raging inferno. Whenever the man spies an enemy unit, he silently pulls his gun from the holster. One bullet, one kill. The enemy never knows what hits them. His is a supernatural, inhuman precision. He is a mechanical soldier, a clockwork man without life, developed expressly for the purpose of fighting in war. The man dashes across the battlefield, staying low. He has orders to scout out the enemy forces. It has long been assumed that both armies are of equal strength. But the enemy has developed a new weapon. One that can launch massive artillery shells over great distances. Their front line has been losing ground. And it is now only a matter of hours before the main base comes into range of the enemy's guns. Having finished his scouting mission and dispatched what enemy soldiers he could find, the man returns to the base. Base is a generous term. In truth, it is little more than a large tent set up to temporarily house their commanders. Inside the tent, a map of the city is spread across a large table. Pawns have been placed on it to show the state of various units. The lead commander is a boy one too young to even serve in battle. Your decision, Highness? The Highness spoken of is the boy, the kingdom's eldest prince. It is he who sent the clockwork man on his scouting mission. And though the prince volunteered for this command, he now finds himself with the unenviable task of making decisions that hold sway over the fate of the entire war. Eventually, one of his generals suggests using some of their own men as a distraction in order to get the drop on the enemy.
prince frowns at this proposal before rejecting it. He is still clearly a boy in thought, as well as appearance. He is unable to sacrifice any of his own men, even when it might lead to the survival of many times that number. It is naivety, and it is on clear display for all to see. The general who made the suggestion scoffs at this decision. Your hesitation will kill us all, he cries. He slams both hands on the table to better illustrate his point. Then he announces his intention to take his men and fight as he sees fit, before storming out of the tent in disgust. Such division amongst the ranks only worsens the situation. Yet the prince continues to issue commands. It is unclear what so spurs him to action. The clockwork man stands to one side of the tent and watches the prince from the corner of his eye. Though he says nothing, he knows the lack of leadership will eventually lead the enemy right to their door. And all too soon, this comes to pass. The base is lost, my prince, says the clockwork man. You must flee and save your own life. No, replies the prince. I'll not leave while my men are still out there fighting and dying. Though the man calmly explains that the prince has no choice but retreat, his young charge does not seem to understand. There is a flash. A cannonball explodes into the tent, blowing it apart. All that remains is a massive crater and a few scraps of fabric. The man hears harsh breathing and turns his head. The young prince is running behind him. Just before the cannonball struck, he grabbed the prince and forcibly removed him from the tent. Now, the two of them run through an underground tunnel that leads outside the main part of the city. Behind them, the sounds of war gradually diminish. Icicles hang from the eaves. The world outside is enrobed in white. The snow here is deep and cold. The trees, bushes, and grasses all lie buried, silently waiting for the arrival of spring. A girl of tender age gazes out the window. Here you go, honey. The girl turns to face the speaker and finds her mother offering her a cup with steam furling from the top. It's filled with warm goat milk. Her mother swears by it, claiming it's the best thing for warding off winter's chill. But the girl doesn't feel strongly about it one way or the other. Uh, thanks, 
she says. She accepts the cup from her mother and returns her attention to the outside world, taking small sips now and then. I wonder when your father will come home, murmurs her mother. Without waiting for a response, she quietly retreats back to the kitchen. The girl exhales on the window, her breath warm from the milk. It clouds over in white. She runs her finger across the spot, sketching idle patterns. She is not allowed to play outside during the winter, so boredom is her constant companion. During such times, even a window can make a decent playmate. The girl lets her attention drift as she looks out the window at the piles of snow beyond. Her small house sits halfway up a snowy mountain. The girl and her mother are usually the only occupants. Her father is rarely home. According to her mother, he is an adventurer of sorts who is always off traveling the world. The girl isn't sure what kind of job an adventurer is exactly. All she knows is that her father is very busy. But her mother has a litany of complaints about him, and she is never shy to make her opinions known. Your father never listens. He's stubborn as a mule, drunk as a skunk, and he never, ever, ever thinks about his family. He only cares about his damn adventures. And she always finishes her rant with the same exasperated phrase, I honestly don't know what to do with that man. The girl is too young to speak with her mother as an equal. But as her mother has no one else to talk to, she grumbles away, as much to herself as her daughter most days. Recently, her mother told the girl a story. Four years ago, when the girl was born, her father had apparently been off on one of his adventures. Wait, said the girl when she first learned of this. So you gave birth to me alone? Her mother replied with a chuckle. Oh, I knew he wouldn't come home, so I made sure to call a midwife up from town ahead of time. The girl nodded as though she understood and said, Gee, Mom, that's pretty crazy. When the father finally returned from that freewheeling adventure, his daughter could already hold her head up on her own. After that, her mother raised her almost entirely alone. The girl would always gaze in bewilderment at her father during his rare visits home and figured that perhaps his behavior was normal and that's just what fathers are. But she could not help but feel concerned by the dark look that often fell upon her mother's face. She doesn't hate her father, not really anyway. But once she became old enough to understand some things, she started to resent the way he treated her mother. One year, her father came home before the arrival of spring. That was the night it happened. It led to one of the worst moments of her life. The three of them sat around a table enjoying a meal. Suddenly, her father, drunk as usual, leaned over to her and said, You know, if you were a boy, I'd take you on an adventure with me. Before she knew it, her eyes were filled with tears. Why am I crying about this, she wondered. For a moment, her mind was a blazing whirl of emotion. Her father had laughed the whole thing off, claiming it was a joke and ruffling her hair. But it was no joke to her. As far as she was concerned, her father had denied her very existence. As the days passed, another emotion began to bud within the girl, one far different from her usual sadness and isolation. It was a spirit of defiance toward her father.
A pale and bloody arm flails in the air. The hand can grab nothing. The hand will grab nothing. Even if it could, it is too fearful a thought. It longs for escape, yearns for it. But if it is only going to break in the end, what is the purpose of obtaining it? A poem of wayward imprisonment. The woman's bloody hand holds a knife. Her finger notes the light sensation of blade against bone. It is so very familiar. This feeling, one home to a science while taking countless lives, is the sensation. Her life has been spent with a blade in her hands, and she does not intend to fail now. She puts pressure on her middle and ring fingers, while the rest curl tightly around the hilt. Almost as if they are drawing in the death she senses. The bones will separate, the head will fall, the... Hang on. Woman and blade alike pause at the voice. The voice, high in tone like a ringing bell, continued. Leave the head. With mackerel, you don't take the head off until you're ready to remove the rest of the guts. The woman with the knife replies with a question. And what of the bones? It's okay to cut those, but don't separate it entirely. Cooking is very different from killing, muses the woman. Yeah, I suppose it would be, replies the speaker. They giggle slightly while imparting this bit of wisdom. The setting sun floods the room with persimmon light. It is a small interval between the sweltering summer and the coolness of autumn. The sun flees the world earlier each day. And as the day takes its leave, night stretches out greedy fingers to reclaim what was stolen in the dawn. The speaker continues. Once you've taken out the innards, you can move on to the bloodline. Bloodline? The woman stands, knife in hand, and awaits an answer. She typically wielded her blade on a battlefield, not in a kitchen, and is unable to find a comfortable grip on the paring knife. Apparently it's muscle. See the dark red parts there? The bloodline. An apt name. A girl of about 16, the speaker, peers over the shoulder of the woman with the knife and smiles, her long hair fluttering. Does my cooking amuse you? asks the woman. She stares at the cutting board as she says it, but her annoyance is clear. <laughs> it is cute to see someone who's so cool in a fight have trouble with a mackerel. The girl grins as she says this, lighting up the room. Ashamed, the woman looks away. This only serves to delight the girl all the more. I'm obviously no expert, says the woman. I did not grow up doing such things. Yeah, well, I'd never done it either until that day. <sighs> the woman knows this well. With nothing to say in return, she falls to silence. That day. The two of them know exactly what this means. Five years ago, early summer, heavy rain blanketed the sky. It was the day the assassin met the girl, her target. She was going to take her life as she had countless others. The girl was ready to die. Perhaps she even sought it. But the woman did not kill her. 
call it a whim. But that day, that whim, had brought them to where they are now. Theirs is a relationship forged in checkered fate. They had both cast aside their own lives to form this new one, where each day stretches out in quiet solitude. In the distance, a cricket begins to stir. Hey, I'm sorry, says the girl. I shouldn't have teased you. You're the only one who actually works around here anyway, so thank you. I really appreciate it. The woman turns to look over her shoulder at her young companion. Flattery will get you nowhere. Turning away once more, she utters a weak protest. But the girl knows this action is an admittance of defeat, and her radiant smile lights up anew. Enough foolishness. Tell me what to do with this creature. Well, you took the bloodline out, so now you have to wash it. The woman nods, picks the fish up off the cutting board, and dips it into a pail of cool water. Blood seeps out of the mackerel, staining the water a faint red.